So for the next hour, we're going to discuss how to help couples impacted by domestic abuse. Uh, first, we're going to discuss helping the survivor. I do want to say this is um, when I teach women um, to be leaders in the refuge, they go through a three to four month training process that includes reading. and So you guys are getting the 500,000 foot version. And there are going to be things that I'm actually most interested in that I actually need to bypass or just barely touch on tonight because we just don't have the time. So I want to give you that caveat going in. Um, this is not an exhaustive. You can't leave here and be fully equipped to help survivors or perpetrators of abuse. But my hope is that when you leave here, you'll be able to respond to it in a more wise and, and gospel-centered manner than, than if you were educated at all. So, um, in the refuge, we use a four-part process to help the survivor. Uh, that's organized using the acrostic heel. Uh, hear the cries of the oppressed, establish safety, apply the gospel, and lead in developing new patterns. First, we need to hear the cries of the oppressed. <coughs> and that begins, there's a lot to it, but the one I really want to focus on tonight is believing her. Believe her. For some of you, this may sound too basic to even be mentioned. Um, I found it the most important thing to start with. I'm continually amazed at how often survivors of abuse are not believed. Um, especially in the church. Especially in the church. Uh, what's difficult about these situations is it's almost always a he said, she said. Uh, the Ray Rice elevator video is not the norm. It, it's almost always she says she's being abused, or she may not even know it's abuse at the time. He flatly denies it and tells you all the awful things she's doing. And you have to decide who to believe. Uh, there is rarely any hard evidence. On occasion, people ask me, what facts do you have that he's abusing her? And they think they've really got me in a corner that I've never thought about objective facts. And I respond with, what facts do you have that he's not abusing her? If he is abusing her, what facts would you expect to find? Uh, think about psychological abuse. Are, are you going to have any evidence there? Most abuse takes place behind closed doors. Um, they don't abuse their wives in public where there's witnesses. They're not stupid. They're not morons. Uh, again, they're very, typically very different people behind closed doors. Even with physical abuse, He's usually learned to do it in a way that doesn't leave any evidence. Um, there's a woman in the refuge whose husband's, her husband's favorite mode of physical abuse was he, he would strangle her. And the first time he did it, he left bruises shaped like finger marks on her neck. So after that, he learned to use his forearm to do it. And he would leave no marks that way. Are you going to find any evidence that that woman is being abused? No. We have another woman in the refuge whose husband would routinely punch her in the head instead of the face so that it wouldn't leave any physical marks. Uh, it could give her a concussion, but it wouldn't leave any physical evidence. So uh, when abuse is taking place, um, it's simply she says one thing, he says another, and you have to decide who you believe. So why am I saying you should believe the woman? Here are, here are a few things to think about. Are you concerned she may be exaggerating or blowing things out of proportion? This is a real common concern. But in fact, most women who think they might be in an abusive relationship don't exaggerate. They tend to minimize. Most of them tend to minimize. They've been conditioned by their abusers to think that his behavior is normal or even justified especially if they grew up in an abusive home as children. And if she does find the courage to call him out on it, a standard response is crazy-making, trying to make her think she's lost touch with reality. And after years of hearing that, you start to believe it. Um, so most women that think they're being abused don't exaggerate. They minimize. I was once meeting with a survivor of abuse, and I asked her, how long has it been since he was physically violent with you? She said, oh, it's been a year. Well, I mean, a month ago he threw something at me, but that's not the same thing. 
And I said, he threw something. What did he throw? A bottle. Did the bottle have anything in it? She said, yeah, it was full. Did it hit you? Yeah, it hit me right here. So I asked her in a very nice way, could you please explain to me how a husband throwing a full bottle and hitting his wife in the throat is not physically violent? And she said, because I'm minimizing it? Yeah. They tend to minimize. So as disconcerting as this might be, uh, whatever she tells you about her relationship, chances are it's even worse than what she's describing. Not less. It's typically worse. Also, many survivors will often just tell you a little bit about the abuse at the beginning to see how you respond. They're concerned that if they tell you everything, it would seem too bad to be believed or realistic. So they'll just give you the tip of the iceberg and see how you respond. And if you respond favorably, if you believe her and earn her trust, then as time goes, she'll unfold more and more of the story for you. So developing a relationship of trust with her is absolutely essential. Are you concerned she's lying? Uh, perhaps she's trying to create a reason to divorce him. Maybe she wants to take all his money and take the children and, and live on easy street. Uh, I recently spoke to a Christian counselor who thought one of uh, our clients in the refuge was doing this exact thing. Uh, he actually told her that he thought she was being led astray by Satan. So imagine being abused and you go to a professional counselor with a doctor of ministry degree in counseling and he tells you, you are being led astray by Satan because you want to, to uh, leave your husband. Now, I really can understand what people would think of, of such a scenario. It's actually fairly common in Hollywood movies and TV shows. Uh, you have the diabolical wife who wants to take the husband for all he's worth. From my vantage point, it is very, very out of touch with reality. For many of the women that we work with, leaving the relationship is just too hard. Here's reality. She typically has no money because he's controlled it all. She has no place to live. A lot of times it's not safe for survivors to live in their own homes. He won't leave. Or if he does, he'll show up whenever he wants. So she's really not safe from abuse there. So she has to leave and has no place to, to live. She often has, this is not the case with all. Some of the women in the refuge are educated women who, who have professional jobs. But the majority of them uh, have no education beyond high school and very little work experience, either because their husband has prevented them from those things, remember isolation, or because like a lot of Christian women, they've poured their lives into raising their children. So it's been 20 years since they've worked or had a job. Um, and so she has to find a way to support herself and her children. Any job she can hope to find is, going to be, is not going to be very high paying. And now, so now she has the joy of being a single parent trying to raise children and she can barely make ends meet. Uh, the only way leaving makes sense is if abuse is her only alternative. That's the only way this situation is, is advantageous to her. Leaving is just too hard. I've seen it time after time after time. And most women know exactly how hard it's going to be and that's why some of them stay. One of the biggest reasons, people wonder why, why do these women stay in abusive relationships? So one of the biggest reasons, they're economically dependent. They need their husbands to support them. That's the reason many of them leave. Now if a man is being accused of abuse, he has all the incentive in the world to deny it. But most women have no incentive to falsely accuse their husbands. They simply don't. Um, and by the way, the survivor that the counselor accused of gold digging, ended up uh, accepting a settlement where she received no money. And her husband was a millionaire. And she just wanted out. Just let me out and I'll be happy. So now she has the privilege of starting life over in her late 40s. Um, so much for her counselor's theory. I really had nothing to stand on. Last night someone asked, how do you know abuse is taking place? That's an excellent question. It really is. Uh, very valid. We know because abuse occurs in the very specific patterns we've discussed. Okay, so when we sit down with someone, we ask her questions that get her to describe her relationship. And that description either conforms or doesn't conform to these patterns. 
Um, you know, you ask, you ask her questions and it turns out he's very controlling. He's always criticizing her. He's always putting her down. He constantly threatens and intimidates her. It's really not that hard to see when you know what you're looking for. Uh, it's like you go into a doctor and you say, yeah, I've got a stuffy nose, a cough, a headache, and I'm just completely tired and run down. Do you have any idea what's wrong with me? Well, it sounds like you have a cold. <laughs> when you know the symptoms, it's, it's really not that hard to identify. Um, and most or all women who, who come to see us, it's not like a woman, for a woman to falsely accuse her husband and come meet with us and her description of their marriage to conform to patterns of abuse, she would have had to have diabolically planned this out and studied up on domestic abuse ahead of time before coming in. And that's just simply... Again, that would be a great plot for a Hollywood movie, but that's just not the way people in the real world are. Um, most of the women who come and meet with us know something is wrong, but they can't put their finger on it. It's very rare for women to come and say, I am being abused. It's actually quite rare. Any questions at all about believing her, hearing cries of the oppressed? I can tell you horror story after horror story of women not being believed by their churches. Uh, as a pastor, I, I have had to do a lot of apologizing on behalf of the church. A lot. So, part two of HEAL is establish safety. Uh, this is really, really important. Most survivors will not experience healing until they're safe from the abuse. Uh, they need to be not abused anymore before they can start overcoming it. Uh, healing cannot occur in a context of continued abuse and oppression. And most, many survivors will have to separate from their partners in order to experience safety. And it's very, very common. Um, and in fact, we actually think it's the wisest thing. Now we'll talk about what, what a separation that leads to actual reconciliation looks like. But Options a survivor may have to establish safety include calling the police, uh, going to a battered women's shelter, uh, maybe in other form of housing, living with a relative uh, or a friend, a temporary order of protection. That's what a restraining order is called in Montana. You could take out a restraining order. You can actually take out a restraining order where the husband is not allowed to come within 500 feet of the house in Montana so she can stay at the house. Uh, the issue is some abusive men won't honor that. They'll just run right over the top of it and risk the legal consequences. A structured separation, which again we'll talk about at the end. Uh, you can request church discipline. That needs to be done very carefully, and it needs to be done with uh, her safety um, as, a, as a top priority. For example, you never want to sit down and confront an abusive man without his wife knowing and being in a safe place. Sit down, guess what? You're abusive. Here's your censure. You're under church discipline. What do you think he's going to do when he goes home? So I've done that. I've been the guy who does that. But the wife always knows and approves and is in a safe place when it happens. So, And then divorce. Divorce would be the most, um, the most extreme, but, but it is very common. Um, this will probably get into a whole bunch of questions, but I'll just say it anyway. Um, Kevin and I were talking about this earlier. Um, at our church, we believe that domestic abuse of any kind is biblical grounds for divorce. And actually, our denomination has a position paper on divorce and remarriage that takes that exact position. So that's not something I just baked in my oven this morning. It's, it actually has a long history in the church. It's, it's emotional abandonment. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, I'm sure David and uh, Kevin could point you to the position paper. Um, I can talk with you about it afterwards. But... Um, divorce is also a means she can take to protect herself. Now, the most dangerous time in an abusive relationship is when the survivor takes measures to protect herself. That's the most dangerous time. He was asked um, men who kill their wives and then go kill their children themselves. The majority of domestic abuse homicides take place when the wife is trying to leave the relationship. That doesn't mean every time she, you try to leave 
it's going to kill you. It's actually quite rare. But that's the most dangerous time. It might not be homicide that he attempts, but the abuse will typically escalate. The abuser feels that his control is being threatened, right? And so his standard instinct is to take abusive measures to regain control. That's what he does every day of his life in his marriage, and that's what he, he usually continues to do. Um, this is especially true if the survivor separates from her partner or tries to end the relationship. So as you think about ministering to survivors, this has two really important consequences for, for how you do things. First, if the survivor leaves the home for her own safety, it is often wise for her to do so without her partner's knowledge. Um, I spend a lot of time in the refuge training teaching people how to get women out covertly without their husband's knowledge. Um, like, yeah, kind of feels stealth. But it's, 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 a lot of times it's really important. Um, second, and this is absolutely huge, any action a survivor takes to protect herself also has the risk of putting her in danger. Uh, it's kind of a catch-22. For example, if she calls the police, they, it's really common for the police to come to the house but not arrest the husband because they don't have enough evidence to make an arrest. So what do you think happens to her when they leave? It's not good. It is not good. <laughs> and that's one reason why I personally, I, at the refuge, we would never call the police um, find out about abuse, that's a survivor's decision because she's going to have to live with the consequences of it. I don't, I'm not, my physical safety is not threatened if I call the police. Only hers is. So I don't want to take that decision out of her hands. Um, if she leaves the home, he could find out where she's staying. Again, it's very rare that he would show up there and do something public, um, but you would never want to rule it out. You would never say, oh, that will never happen. Um, if she gets a restraining order, he may choose to ignore it. Uh, that, that, of course, will come with legal consequences if she reports it. But in, in the moment, that piece of paper is not going to protect her. It's just a piece of paper. Uh, so um, he, he, she gets a restraining order. That could really enrage him, and he could fly off the handle. So all of that's to say great care has to be taken, and great wisdom has to be exercised if you're helping a survivor secure her own safety. None of this means don't do it. In fact, I think it's absolutely essential that a survivor experience safety. Um, as I've been consulting with um, a group from your church on a case they're working with, it's been constant. Her safety is the top priority. But when you're doing that, you have to recognize the risks involved so that you can make wise and informed decisions. So, Have any questions at all about helping a survivor establish safety? Yes. Um, it's it, if the survivor leaves the home, would she and the children lose rights to that home? No. Mm -hmm. it, like, she yeah, asked she if a survivor, now I don't know what Colorado law is. I've never heard of that. Certainly in Montana, I can say that wouldn't be the case. Um, like in a divorce proceeding, yeah, no, she wouldn't lose any, any right to that. So he can't say, well, she left me. But he can say, um, he, he can sure, say he can anything, say. No. but whether or not a judge would actually take that into account. I don't um, trust judges anymore. <laughs> yeah, well. I don't, so, um, yeah. you know, I yeah. don't know if that's a, a legitimate reason for a woman to think, um, even though I'm not safe, I don't want to lose my home, or he's going to take the home. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I'll put it this way. I have never ran across that. Not once. And I've had, I've helped numerous countless survivors um, get the safety. So Even if there's no restraining order yeah. in place. Yeah. Okay. And in Montana, a lot of times, you can get a restraining order for two or three weeks uh, without physical abuse. Just if she feels threatened or intimidated, she can take out a restraining order, um, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, often, abuse will escalate when this, so just because he hasn't been physically abusive before, it doesn't mean he won't be she tries to leave. So, any other questions about safety, establishing safety? If you're in a situation where you know a survivor of abuse and you're trying to help her establish safety, I would highly, highly recommend that you call. You could call me, um, or that you call. There's got to be at least one, probably a few battered women shelters in town. Even if you're not sending her there. 
those people are very, very experienced at crisis management and getting a woman to safety, and they will know all the angles, and there's too much at stake for you to try to do this yourself. So I would, I mean, I was, the first training I got was from a battered women's shelter. Um, they're pagan <laughs> and unbelievers and, and uh, hostile to the gospel, but they knew how to get a woman to safety. And they knew and they, things that I never would have thought of. And they, they know how to care for them. They do know how to care for them, yes. And we've got a great one here called yeah. Tessa. Tessa. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. It's good. The is it a Christian? The only problem I've had with Tessa is, because I've called them as sisters of the deacons, they never give me the same story. One was her, was her son, and they wouldn't uh, see have her take her. And one, she had a child, and they wouldn't take the go to the living room with the child. But yes, they is it a Christian advice. shelter, or is it just no. really caring? Okay. See, that's wonderful. The the one in Kalispell is militantly feminist. I mean, militant, um, and they they're. I have a great relationship with the director. I'm trying to witness to her and um, and whatnot. We have a great relationship, but um, most of the women there would, would believe that Christianity is part of the problem um, and it's oppressive to women. So, um, anyway, all that being said, um, I would still, if it was a woman's only option for safety, I would send her to the shelter. Uh, it's not like she's going to go there and become a feminist. She's going to be working with me. And, um, it's just fine to send them even to the worst of, uh, ideologically, the worst of shelters. Um, and again, they're experts. This is what they do. So pl please don't try to do it yourself uh, until you've been trained. So. Is, is the only option for the woman to leave? Well, again, it's, it's her decision. Um, the yeah. issue is, here's what I, I run into that a lot, and here's what I ask her. I say, what are the chances that he will show up on the doorstep of the house or just walk in? If he leaves, is your home going to be a place of safety for you? And not just physical safety. Is he going to walk in whenever he wants and just sit down on the couch and watch TV <clears throat> and before you know it, he's emotionally abusing you, verbally abusing you? Um, when he knows where she's at, and especially entitlement, he feels entitled to be in his own home and keep no one keep me out of my home. So, um, you know, when we go through a structured separation with someone or if he's under church discipline, or there's a restraining order that prohibits him from coming to the house, and if I ask her, do you think he'll honor this? And she says, yes, he will. Then great. Better for you to stay here and be in your own home. If you don't think he'll honor it, mm -hmm. and you want to be safe, you're going to have to leave. But it has to be more than her confronting him. What do you mean? Confronting him to leave. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, totally, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it does. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I thought you were raising your hand. We're just um, all right. So we'll go through the last two parts of HEAL very quickly uh, for the sake of time. Um, the next step is apply the gospel. This is my favorite part as we get into counseling stuff. But um, most of you here are not going to be counseling survivors of abuse long term. So um, I had to cut something. So I'm, I'm covering this very, very quickly. Um, I love counseling. So this is actually my favorite section. Um, Basically, with apply the gospel, you determine how the abuse has damaged her, and then you point her to Christ for healing. Uh, she will be plagued with shame, which is a sense of worthlessness and rejection. The uh, psychological term is low self-esteem. The biblical term is shame. Uh, shame does not just come from guilt. Shame can come not just from sins you commit, but from sins other people commit against you. So it's different from guilt. That's really important. It's just a sense of worthlessness and rejection. Um, and it's pretty much universal among survivors of abuse. Um, Ed Welch has written the greatest book I've ever read on shame. It's called Shame Interrupted. It's probably the best book I've read since I got out of seminary. Um, so that's one I would highly recommend. Shame Interrupted it is excellent. Um, Ed Welch. He's with the Christian Counseling and Education Foundation. And the title again? Shame Interrupted. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's superb. Really theologically robust, but yet very easy to read and understand. So counteract that, you point her to her position of honor in the kingdom of God. Truths like, you are a daughter of the king. You have a position of status and honor in God's kingdom that cannot be taken away from you. 
You are created in God's image. You're created with value and dignity and worth. So you deserve to be treated with respect. Um, the idea that Christ has died to take away your shame. An objective event has occurred in history that removes your shame and placed it on someone else. So now you have no shame. You have no reproach. Um, scripture, particularly in Isaiah, Zephaniah, the Old Testament prophets say some of the most beautiful things about our position of honor in God's kingdom. Um, those are places you'd want to point her to. Zephaniah 3, uh, just off the top of my head. Uh, if you go home tonight and you want to read a passage that just really uplifts you, the end of Zephaniah 3, the, the very last section of that chapter is absolutely beautiful. Another big issue survivors deal with is their relationships are governed by fear. Basically, the abusive relationship becomes the paradigm for all her relationships. Now, that doesn't mean that she lives in constant fear of every person she meets. Rather, um, it's really common for survivors of abuse to be people pleasers, to avoid conflict at all costs, to have a really hard time saying no to people, because in their experience, those things lead to pain. Um, and so... They're, they're relating to people out of fear. Uh, what needs to happen is there needs to be a paradigm shift. Her relationship with God needs to replace the abusive relationship as the new paradigm for her other relationships. And her relationship with God is governed by love. Um, so just as God has loved her, that frees her then to relate to other people out of love. So she can tell someone no if that's what's best for them. Sometimes people need to be told no. She can set boundaries on herself, for herself, in terms of what she's able to do and what she's not able to do, <coughs> and whatnot. There are a lot of other ways survivors are impacted by domestic abuse. Anger issues, bitterness, depression. Um, they're physiological, a lot of them have stomach problems, uh, problems with their teeth uh, because of the stress. Um, there's just all, I mean, I, all kinds. I, I, don't, I don't have time to go through all of them. But these are the two that are really universal um, and that have very, very deep biblical roots in terms of how to deal with them. Shane, yes? Do you have to deal all with women who have a hard time with that relationship with God because of a fearful relationship with their father, you know, the heavenly, our heavenly father, but they have a really bad feeling about the word father? Yeah, you know, um, not that specifically. Um, I have run into that. Mm -hmm. But it's more, for most of the women, it's just, uh, how could God let this happen to me? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of anger at God. I, I run into that all the time. Um, and the way I deal with it, I, I can't answer the why question for them. To, to simply say, well, God allowed this to happen for your sanctification. Um, uh, is not the thing to say. Um, most of them come to a place where, where they are eventually able to see that, but that's not, <laughs> that's just not wise. So instead, where I go is, uh, we have an exercise in the curriculum I've written. We, the curriculum for our support groups is something I've written. Uh, the church has so largely ignored this, I couldn't find anything when we started our support. Now there's a couple, Leslie Vernick has written some things, and, but when we started, there was really nothing. Um, and, and we have an exercise in there called Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted. And uh, they go through Isaiah 53, which is a prophecy of Christ's crucifixion, and essentially discover that Jesus is a fellow survivor of abuse. Um, and so the idea is, God has not forsaken you. He's not abandoned you. He loves you so much that he entered into an abusive situation um, and walks in it right alongside you. So you can come to him as a fellow survivor of abuse who knows your pain, uh, who knows exactly how you feel. This is not a distant and detached God who doesn't care for you. This is someone who probably knows, resonates with your experience of abuse better than anyone. So that's, that's the tack that we go. Um, we point them to the incarnation and the crucifixion of Christ. Um, and it's pretty powerful. It's, we have in there this homework assignment. Everything in the curriculum uh, has a homework assignment that gets them studying scripture on their own. 
and then they come to the group and we discuss the homework and then we have a 